love of family, love of faith, and love of country. And little did I realize that those three things would uh, eventually help me make it through the darkest times of my life. And so uh, my father, he was World War II. My brother was in during Vietnam. And so uh, I, I always wanted to serve our country. Uh, and of course, I broke the code, uh, the code of army, right? How many Marines do we have in the house? Any Marines? Not very many. Semper Fi Marine. Uh, how many Army? Yeah. Now, you guys know what Army stands for, right? Aren't ready Marines yet. <laughs> <laughs> I know. My dad, my brother looked at me just like that, told me, just looked at me. Like, what? It was, uh, but you know, it's the camaraderie. And uh, uh, like I said, my, my mother, my father, uh, American Legion, Washington, Missouri. So many nights we would be at American Legion, uh, barbecues, uh, you know, playing wiffle ball, you name it. And every parade in Washington, Missouri, uh, I would be carrying the flag at St. Gertrude's. How many of you, I know some of you have been to the St. Gertrude's uh, for different picnics, dinners. Uh, I used to raise the flag there when I went to grade school. Uh, I mean, I was so honored. But little did I realize how important that flag really was. And so, like I said, uh, graduating from high school in uh, 1976, and I really did not know where I wanted to go in life, um, but I, I knew that there was more outside of the little town of Crockett, Missouri. And so as my brother, and as my father, and as many of our relatives within the family, uh, I joined the Marine Corps. And I got on my first airplane, 1976, so I went to San Diego, California. I was a Hollywood Marine. Had no idea what the, the lady said. Uh, she goes, boy, it's your lucky day. And I said, ma'am, and she goes, you're going to be a Hollywood Marine. I had no idea that there were two uh, you know, bases. One uh, camp, or excuse me, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Paris Island and the other San Diego. So uh, I was carrying orders for five others. And so I had orders for uh, the other uh, place. And so I went to San Diego, graduated. My parents, God love them, they had never been on an airplane either. Uh, they came out for my graduation. And as you can see this picture right here, I mean, I can tell you that 13 weeks after boot camp first started, we all came and arrived that night, uh, that first night uh, at uh, San Diego MCRD, and we all looked different. I can tell you that 13 weeks later, we all look very similar to that picture right here and how incredible I looked back then, how time changes. Um, but my parents walked right past me, didn't even recognize me. Um, and, you know, it was, as they walked past me, I said, Mom, Dad, and they recognized my voice. And so it was one of those things, and it changed, uh, it changed me. And uh, thank goodness I, I, uh, I did go to the boot camp because I really never understood why in boot camp, and by the way, Hank, how much time do we have here? Um, up to an hour. Okay, up to an hour. So you have a watch on? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> guys, there's 444 days here and um, a lot of stories. So I need you to tell me when I've got like 10 minutes left before that hour. You know, and, okay. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, I, I never could understand boot camp. They taught you how to clean clothes with a bar of soap, running water, and a slab of concrete. <laughs> and in that other room, from here to that room right there, was a washing machine and dryer. I'm like, what the heck are we doing this for? This is ridiculous. Little did I realize. I mean, the first 60 days, this would be my toothbrush and a bar of soap that you use to bathe yourself was your toothpaste. And a pair of pants I wore, I wore for 200 days until being released in 1981. Those pair of pants had my left cheek completely hanging out. A ugly picture, you can just imagine. But um, I had no idea that the things that my parents had taught me, um, and Mary knows, and uh, Hank, you know, uh, our family, very staunch Catholic. My mother uh, used to serve at St. Gertrude's. And my, the only thing my mother taught me, or told me, when I left for boot camp, she goes, now Rocky, you make sure that you go to church when you're in Marine Corps, because someday you're going to need God. Okay, Mom, I'll, I'll go to church. And I would serve 5 o'clock a.m. morning mass every Sunday. Why? Because my father was the usher. So as he was the usher, <laughs> he would have to bring his son to be the actual uh, server. 
So I would go and serve, and I always asked my dad, Dad, can't you get a later mass on Sunday morning? Um, but my mother cried uh, when I went to boot, or excuse me, my father cried. My mother, she just said, make sure you go to church. And they were so right. Um, they were so right. Those three things, love of family, love of faith, and love of country. And as uh, Hank and uh, Mary and I were talking, uh, those memories, folks, those memories of growing up in a small town of Crockville, Missouri, they kept me alive. And I, they're embedded in my head forever because um, it was the darkest time of my life, although the best time of my life, because I had been in the service, I had uh, I'd gone from this small kid from Crockwood, Missouri, population 50 dogs and cats included, and I went to uh, Asia for a year, um, came back, uh, went to Camp Geiger, North Carolina, went to Europe for a year. I was on a helicopter carrier, and it's 1976, uh, 75, the Vietnam War ended, and uh, I go into the service, and I'm traveling the world, but there was one duty within the Marine Corps, it was a very unique elite duty, and it was uh, Marine Security Guard, which is your duty is to provide protection to personnel, property, and uh, documents of the American government. So uh, you go in, you apply, you go through oral, written, all these different testing, you go to the State Department uh, School in Quantico, where I graduated. Uh, my mother and father uh, came out, and my girlfriend at the time, she came out to uh, to witness my uh, my graduation, and at the ceremony, the uh, four-star general is talking about the incident that just happened in Iran that year, where they attacked the American embassy and there was a, a shootout. Uh, Ambassador Sullivan was sent back to the States, and uh, three Marines, I believe, were killed uh, at that time, but they said that never again would that situation ever happen. Little did I realize, seven days after my graduation, I found myself on an airplane heading to Tehran, Iran, uh, a beautiful country. Uh, anybody by chance ever been to uh, Iran? I mean, because Iran at one time, ladies and gentlemen, January of 1979, there were 20,000 Americans in the country of Iran. The Shah of Iran was the most wealthiest man in the world, and he loved our military arsenal. Loved our airplanes, we had F-4s, you name it, we had our own American school, we had our own American shopping. Well, after the uh, Shah of Iran fled the country in 1979, 20,000 Americans left the country and 65 Americans arrived. Well, that is, remained. Uh, demonstrations when I arrived November 4th were occurring every day because, as I said, the Shah had fled. He had fled the country in 1979, January, and he was now in exile. It just so happened that four, two weeks before November 4th, 1979, the Shah of Iran had asked the United States to come in. President, who was the president in 1979? President Carter. And this is, folks, this is not about Republicans, it's not about Democrats, it's about a country that hates, 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 hates our country. And they have humiliated each president for the past 43 years. I want you to remember that because I have had to sit here and watch it for 43 years and it's hurt every day I see what Iran continues to do. And they're very good negotiators. They, they know how to manipulate. So here I was at the American Embassy and we hear that the Shah of Iran was gonna be allowed into the United States. President Carter in a meeting tells his staff, so you want the Shah to arrive into our country. What are you going to do when those people, the Islamic Republic of Iran, take our people hostage? What are you going to say? Sure enough, when he said that two weeks later, that's exactly what happened. And President Carter knew. Um, and so anyway, they, uh, it was November 4th, 1979. Um, it was the uh, morning I had just gotten off guard duty. I had uh, security from 11 to 7. Um, I went up, and as Marines know, uh, November 10th is the big Marine Corps birthday. And at the American Embassy, all the other embassies come to our embassy for the big birthday. So I'm at uh, breakfast. I went up, took off all my gear, Shire went down and had breakfast, and it was a 60, uh, there were 65 Americans um, on this 23-acre compound. And I can tell you folks, 
Uh, those of you that have been to an American embassy around the world, any of you, uh, it's pretty secure. I can tell you, uh, nowadays, I can tell you, it's, it's more secure than ever. Uh, and you can see this picture right here. These are actual pictures I'm about to, to show you. Uh, that morning, I am 20 yards to the left, walking into a water pool gate where I had just left three individuals at the visa building, which were on the back side of the 23-acre compound. Three of those individuals, any of you have seen the movie Argo? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, great movie. I'm having breakfast with three of those six. Little did we realize, folks, that four hours later, our life would be turned upside down and never the same ever since. And so here I am walking into the motor pool gate to get a vehicle, to go out into town to run an errand, and all of a sudden, my walkie-talkie had recall recall. I turn, and I look, and this is what I see. I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that I will go to my freaking grave, and I will tell you that there was no security whatsoever. You can't find one security individual that was at that gate that morning. They were there just to basically raid the American Embassy, and they did. Um, I can tell you, I could run pretty fast back then. Now, I could run pretty fast for a Budweiser or something like that, but um, anyway, I took off. Uh, I was to the left, about 20 yards. I took off to uh, my left to run back to the Chantry, which was through a haze of uh, bushes and trees, and Billy Gallegos was on guard. Uh, he was getting ready to close the foreign steel door and saw me being chased, kept it open long enough for me to get in. We closed the door and we get back. Anybody want to tell me for a $20 bill, what were our weapons in 1979? Anybody? Raise your hand. M1. Raise your hand. M1. All right, M1, no sir. Anybody else want to try? Raise your hand. No, would you believe a 38 State Department issued pistol and a sawed-off shotgun? That's what I said. Oh, what? You're gonna be kidding me. Um, but no, that's what he had. A snub nose 38 pistol and a sawed off shotgun. As a good Marine, I went back, doing my big old flak jacket, those 50 pound things. Uh, I'm in my civilian clothes. And uh, out of 12 Marines, seven Marines made it into the American Embassy that morning. And obviously, nobody was going to get in, nobody was going to get out. We secured the embassy. There were people trying to get in, our Americans who couldn't open the door. Um, and so those of you who have seen the movie, I can tell you the movie was so accurate at the very beginning of them coming over the wall. I mean, my leg was twitching when I went to the movie. Things after that weren't as, uh, as realistic, but again, the movie wasn't about us. It was about those six people that were in the visa building. Uh, but I can tell you that I went, uh, got in, we, uh, I was secured. Uh, I was given the, the post, the main door, the door I just came into. And I'm sitting on my, uh, my knees, and I'm loading my shotgun. And my adrenaline, folks, I can tell you, as a 22-year-old kid, uh, my adrenaline was pumping because these people were pounding on the door. Uh, by the time I got my shotgun and started loading my pistol, uh, you go through this training, and this training is all coming too, but now they're pounding on the door with a telephone pole. The plaster is falling from the four-inch steel door and they're chanting death to America outside. In fact, on November 3rd, uh, the day before, they had over 200,000, 200,000 Iranians out in front of the American embassy, all chanting death to America. I can tell you that day, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Revolutionary Guard, provided protection to the embassy. They were surrounding the embassy. The morning of November 4th, uh, somebody obviously paid somebody the night before and said, hey, just don't go to work tomorrow. And so, sure enough, here we were, pounding, they're pounding on the door. Billy's downstairs. I radioed to get uh, three Marines. Um, and I'm happy to tell you that uh, the next four hours, folks, seven Marines, seven Marines held the American Embassy for four more hours, waiting for the host government. The American government, they were 18 hours away, 18 hours. And what the Islamic Republic of Iran had done was in the basement, they tore the bars of the windows out. Billy Gallegos was downstairs watching the other foreign steel door. He radios and says, they've gotten in. I'm closest to the steps. I 
break away from the front door because the only thing that's coming, and I had no idea that door wasn't going to go anywhere because it was uh, rebarred into the wall. It was just a plaster falling. But now they've gotten into the basement. So I break away, draw my gas mask. I don't even remember putting my gas mask on. That's, you know, things are happening so fast. And I get down there and Billy now has his gas mask on and he points down the corridor and it's Billy to the right, I'm to the left. And as you can see, a bellow of smoke come from one of the offices. And all of a sudden, who comes around the corner of the room but four Iranian women in black shadows? That is the second freaking thing I will never forget and I will tell every American. That morning, they knew, they knew the mindset that we would not shoot unarmed innocent women. And at this point in time, we're being screamed, don't fire, don't retaliate, help us on the way. There was no help coming, but you know, here we were doing what we were supposed to, sitting there walking slowly. And behind these Iranian women were the Iranian men, pushing them forward. They know the mindset. And you know what? The human rights in Iran, women in the Iran couldn't even vote in 1979. Your Iranian women can just now start to go to a soccer game in Iran. I mean, the human rights, uh, it was just incredible. And folks, I can tell you, that morning, November 4th, you have no idea how many times I looked back at that morning, and uh, I would have gone against my direct orders had I, had I pulled the trigger. But I can tell you, for the next 30 days, um, that morning of November 4th, 1979, 52 Americans were stripped their freedom, their dignity, and their pride, known as the Iran hostage crisis. Um, we, don't, we popped tear gas, they fled the building, we went up to the very top of the embassy um, where we secured ourselves. Uh, it's now, like I said, four hours into the whole ordeal. Uh, President Carter's on the phone, he's asking what's going on, he's not talking to me, he's talking to another high-ranking uh, State Department official, we're saying that, hey, the government's not coming. Uh, they have now started to take people that uh, were Americans. They were already blindfolded, just like what you see right here. Uh, blindfolded, these are all live pictures, and, and I, I can't see why my chin and my nose is not popping out of this picture somewhere. But I'm amongst that group. But um, there were people that they brought earlier uh, on the other side of the door. And here we were secured, enjoying what that American flag represents, freedom. Our friends, our colleagues were on the other side, and what they were doing was putting pistols to their heads, and they were making them beg for their lives on the other side of this floor and steel door. And President Carter gets on and says, give yourself up and we'll get this resolved with diplomacy, because there was no way that we could hold for four, 18 more hours. And in 1979, we never had to read the reactionary forces that we, we have to this day. Um, so anyway, that morning, November 4th, 1979, uh, that is when they took us. The Marines were the first ones outside the door. Um, the other pictures of people were uh, individuals that they had taken as they were trying to get to the chancery. And once we closed the door, they couldn't uh, get in. Um, and so we, uh, that morning, I'll never forget, it was misty now. And uh, all of you have probably gone through a traumatic time in your life. Um, I can tell you that being held hostage was like a car accident, but a different car accident for the next day for 444 days. 444 days. I had spent two Thanksgivings, two Christmases, and excuse my mind, uh, excuse my uh, my mouth, the shithole um, that I never thought that I would ever uh, get out. Um, these pictures, ladies and gentlemen, imagine sitting in that chair that you're sitting right now. We sat for the next 30 days, not 30 minutes, 30 freaking days we sat. Unless it was your interrogation, did you sit in that corner of the room and in a corner of the room we were put, one time we were in the ambassador's house and we were tied, our arms were tied to the arms of the chair, just like your chairs right there, and our feet were tied to the feet of the chair. You sat there for 30 days, at night they would put you down on the floor and tie your wrist to your ankles. And in the Marine Corps, they didn't train us on that. They didn't teach us, you know, about long stay, you know, peace. But I can tell you now in the military, they do have uh, escape and evasion type of, uh, you know, training. Um, I hate to say that one individual broke during an interrogation uh, as we were held hostage. Um, this stand right here, I can tell you, folks, um, I'm a true believer that a Muslim is not born with uh, hatred. They're taught hatred. I can tell you 
from November 4th of 1979, I could hear young children. I have grandkids that are uh, five, three, and 11, and uh, no, 10, uh, 12. And I could hear these young children chanting Death to America. That was 1979. And you add 43 years into that, and you wonder why people can walk up to a, a wall and pull a cord and ball bearings come flying out of C4? Well, of course, they've been trained to do that. And they taught them to do that since 1979. Um, this man right here had a chance to end that crisis, but he agreed to what uh, was happening, is holding hostages. I told Khomeini, uh, he was the start of it. And I can tell you to this day, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Mullahs are freaking thugs. They are thugs. They are wonderful Iranian people that want better, but the Mullahs are thugs. And I want so much, ladies and gentlemen, I want so much to go back to my interrogators, interrogators that say, you know what, the reason why you're here is because the Shah, he was a bad person. And the Sawback, they were bad. That was the, the Shah's army. I want to say, you know, are you telling me that I told Khomeini was better? And you're telling me that the freaking revolutionary guard are better than the Soviet? There's no freaking way what they have done since 1979. And it hurts uh, to this day. The American Embassy, a beautiful 23-acre compound, um, ladies and gentlemen, it was being destroyed. Uh, like I said, we were tied uh, the first 30 days. And I can tell you in January of 1980, I was put into a room where I spent the next 400 days in a room. I went outside seven times out of 444 days. It's amazing what you can do when you put your mind, your heart, your soul to it. But again, as I told Hank and Mary earlier, all those times of growing up in Washington, in Crockville, Missouri, slave riding down a hotel, I, I went through every movie in my head as I sat in that corner of the room. Every wedding that we had, not every holiday, every Thanksgiving, uh, you know, my mother made the, the best homemade uh, bread, uh, caramel rolls. I mean, I ate her pancakes in a corner of the room. I mean, her pancakes that she had an old black skillet. And I would just sit there in my head, just remember her during a snow day when I was growing up in crop. It didn't snow. It doesn't snow as much as it used to. Uh, back then, but I can remember snow days. I could smell the batter of the pancakes. Get up, I could walk in, and I could see through the little island right there. She's pouring batter on this little skillet, and there's four pancakes, and they're bubbling. I mean, I, I'm going through the whole motion, the whole movie. And she flips them, puts them on a plate with a piece of butter, and I go to the old maple syrup in a container, pry open the top, and I pour the syrup over top of them, and I eat them. I mean, that's how you relive that your past because you were in a very bad situation and you didn't want to sit there and linger on how bad it was. Uh, praying, I've never prayed so hard in my life, folks. I mean, I, I was hoping and praying that uh, God would help me, uh, help me either make it through it or eventually. And imagine two Thanksgivings, two Christmases that we spent and knowing that your family were having a great time back home. But again, I wasn't I wasn't a, a American guy. I was a young, naive kid of raging hormones. Uh, but how many of you had children, right? How many of you had children? Imagine you being my parents. How do you get up each day for 444 days? My father was a concrete mixture driver. My mother worked at a carpet store as a uh, secretary. And every day, the media, by the way, lived in their yard for 444 days. And they wanted to know what you were doing, what's your thoughts, uh, of what was going on. I mean, my mother, I think, made more meals for the, the press, than, but that was her way of passing the time of getting through it. Um, they had never been told that in their life, their son going to be held hostage, and you're going to have to make it through that. Uh, but how they did it, uh, it was incredible. But here I was back uh, in Iran. I had no idea back home they were tying yellow ribbons around planetariums. Uh, the only thing I can remember, folks, being tied to that chair, it's 1979, and the Vietnam War ends, what, 75? And I'm sitting there thinking, there's 65 Americans uh, at the American Embassy. Who's going to care about us? Nobody cared about the Vietnam veterans when they came home. They were spit on when they came home. 
my brother was in during Vietnam, and nobody cared about those guys. So if nobody cared about those thousands of individuals, who's going to care about the Americans at the American Embassy? Had no idea that it had reversed, that everybody wanted to get uh, the hostages or yellow ribbons around trees and, and all this other stuff. And as I mentioned earlier, um, they asked for uh, individuals to make uh, derogatory statements against their government. I can tell you, 444 days, I never made one freaking uh, derogatory statement about my government. And I can tell you, um, I wet my pants many times because they stuck a, a pistol to our head and pulled the trigger. And you just didn't know what was happening. And, and there were gunshots daily. You didn't know who was living, who was dying. Um, the, the first week, you kind of see different people, but I can tell you, if I'm looking at you now, I don't see you until January 20th of 1981 because I was only in a room with two other people. Um, and here's one of those uh, statements. The Canadians, little do we uh, realize, the Canadians uh, freed six uh, Americans. The Canadian ambassador, anybody remember his name? Ken Taylor. And you know why I know his name? I played tennis against him the week before. As a young Marine, um, when I got there uh, October 7th, uh, I was working out, learning my job, and I played tennis every day on clay court. I had never played on clay court before. I'd always been concrete. And I got to be really good. And the tennis court was right behind the ambassador's house. And so the ambassador saw that I was a pretty good tennis player. Two weeks prior, he goes, Rocky, I noticed you're a pretty good tennis player. Would you mind being my partner? I said, sure, I'd be honored. Here we have to play. He goes, we have to play the Canadian ambassador and his assistant. Little did we realize, two weeks, a week earlier, we smoked Ken Taylor. I had a serve that just went ahead. It was just like, poof. And little did we realize, a week later, he rescued six of our people. And uh, there's another story I'll tell you later. But we had no idea. Had no idea, again, the morning November 4th, a lot of stuff was going on. Uh, there were individuals that were uh, to be there shredding. Uh, we were talking about shredders. Now, back then, the shredders all shredded now. One line, now shredders shred in cubes, right? I wonder why they do that now, because you know, if they shred in cubes back then, there was no way that anybody could put together slices of piece, pieces of paper. Uh, we had an incinerator um, that uh, was supposed to work, but it didn't work. Uh, so I can tell you, so many different things uh, had happened, but we had no idea uh, that uh, six Americans had uh, made it home. Uh, President Carter was being forced. Uh, it was the election. And, uh, but we as hostages had no idea. Uh, every time that they would sit there, uh, the whole thing was, do you know how you could get home? No. Uh, if the Shaw returns, you can go home. Well, obviously, uh, little did our government uh, realize that in Iran, they were putting charges on all the hostages. My charge, I was a drug dealer. Uh, so when I went to the Hain judge, and I went to be trialed as a, a drug dealer, Billy Guy, he goes, the other guy I was in prison uh, with, he was a prostitution king. So Jerry Plotkin, the other, the only American that was taken, he was Jewish and he was a merchant. The morning of November 4th, remember when I told you I ran back to the front gate, uh, front door of the chancery, and Billy kept it open long enough for me to squeeze in. We closed the steel door, and all of a sudden we turn, and here's this American bearded guy, and he's holding a briefcase, and he's with this Korean guy. And he goes, hey, I'm in the wrong building. I'm supposed to be at the, uh, the visa building, which was on the other side of the 23-acre compound. I said, sir, we're under attack. Please step away. Don't, don't touch that door. Little did we realize that Jerry was carrying a quarter million dollars in cash in that briefcase. He was over there for his brother as a headhunting service, that hired Koreans to work the minefield. He was just going in to get his visa uh, reissued at the, uh, the visa building, which he was in the wrong place, wrong time. He spent the next 400 days uh, with Billy and I in the room. So little did we know that the United States found out that they were gonna start putting this on trial. President Carter said, I gotta do something. So uh, sure enough, 1980, um, we, had no idea that the United States would ever attempt a rescue operation. I mean, it's for what the uh, hostages, 60 some hostages 
at that time. Uh, they put together one of the most daring special operations. Uh, in fact, special operations was created because of this whole piece right here. Um, they put together a group of people uh, to come over to rescue us. And folks, uh, Folds of Honor, it's an organization that provides scholarships to families of fallen and disabled military. And I can tell you that uh, I had no idea that there was a rescue op operation. We really had no idea until I was released in 1981 of what happened. I can tell you um, that that night of April 25th, um, throughout that day of April 25th, uh, you could hear people run up and down the corridor. You could hear vehicles in the back of the American Embassy because we were locked. We were locked in the American Chancery in offices. They stripped the offices, and I slept on a three of full mattress. My pillow consisted of extra clothes, uh, but that's how you slept in that room. They took everything out except for a table and chairs. And um, that day, you're, you're hearing things happening in the hallway. And you analyze, I mean, you analyze everything that you hear, uh, you saw, you name it. And so that day we're sitting there thinking something's happening. Little do we realize, yeah, something did happen. The night of April 24th, throughout the night, uh, Operation uh, Eagle Claw uh, attempted to come in to rescue us. They, they landed in, uh, the morning of April 25th. And um, again, I'd be here all day uh, telling the story, but a CH-53 helicopter collided with the C-130 and it created a huge ball of fire. Um, eight individuals uh, perished that night. And uh, I can tell you that I was just with some of those individuals and they told me their stories. I told them my story, but we had no idea that the United States uh, would have attempted. That night of April 25th, they come running into the, the art uh, room. And folks, I can tell you, every time that door opened, you jumped. Why did you jump? Because you didn't know that they were going to come in and start shooting or what? Because they told us, if the American government comes in to attempt to rescue, we will kill them. And so that night, they come running into our room. I handcuffed the uh, Billy's or Jerry's left, uh, my left hand's uh, handcuffed to his right hand, my right hand's handcuffed to Billy's right, uh, left hand. We're blindfolded, we're taken from the room, put down into a vehicle, or we're then Jerry's handcuffed to the left, Billy's handcuffed to the right, we're handcuffed, blindfolded. They take a picture from the passenger side. You see a, a flash through the blindfold, and all of a sudden they put a, blind, or a blanket on top of us. That was the night of April 25th, because what they were doing then, the Islamic Republic of Iran, knew that all the hostages were in the chantry. Had that rescue attempt occurred that morning, we would have all been there. The night of April 25th, all the hostages were scattered throughout the country of Iran. There was no way that they were ever going to get us. And so we had no idea. Uh, like I said, they put that blanket on us, and we all three at the same time said, this isn't good. And so they drove us that night. Uh, it was about 8.30, 9 o'clock, I can't recall, till the next day, until uh, about noon. And folks, I can tell you, um, the smells, the sounds, um, I just remember waking up the next day, and uh, if you had to go to the bathroom, you had to do it on yourself. And I remember waking up the next day and hearing these birds chirping, and it was a beautiful sound, but I'm thinking, this can't be heaven. Heaven can't smell like this. <laughs> and uh, they took the blanket off of us, and uh, I mean, you're just drenched in soap and sweat, uh, and just uh, the stench, and they unhandcuffed Jerry, uh, unhandcuffed Billy, they pull us all three out, handcuffed together. They put us into a room, and we had no idea where we were at, where we were going, what. Um, it was a room that had a bathroom. We were able to clean up. One o'clock that night, uh, they put us back into the vehicle, and uh, they they drove us. But uh, these eight individuals, uh, eight individuals, folks, that I will have to live with for the rest of my life, eight individuals that sacrificed their life for my life. Right? How, do you, how do you deal with that for the rest of your life, knowing that they sacrificed their life? And those individuals had families. Uh, they lost not only their life, but their families lost everything that night. Um, like I said, they put us into a vehicle. You can see uh, location one. Uh, we didn't know that they had taken us. It wasn't until we had left uh, that night, uh, the next morning, at uh, 1 o'clock in the morning or so, they said, you've been to this farm. You're not going to another location. 
and the next location that they took us to was Shiraz. Uh, but they didn't tell us that we were in Shiraz until uh, September or April, when we, uh, in September or August, uh, when we finally left. But that, uh, that picture was not an actual picture, but it looked very similar, although we had a blanket. Um, we come back to the American Embassy, and it's uh, uh, September, October uh, of that uh, 1980. And they bring us back, and we drove all the way from Shiraz, if you can see how far Shiraz is here, um, all the way to Tehran. It was over uh, 24 hours uh, that they drove us back. Uh, and again, so many stories. Our vehicle breaks down in the middle of freaking death. It breaks down. I mean, we had three cars, and by this time we finally told them, we were screaming at them. It was so hot, folks. They had a blanket over top of us. We're in a freaking desert. And they finally took the blanket off the, uh, off of us. And through the you know the wet blindfold, you could see that you were on a highway. And all of a sudden, we're driving down, and you can see smoke coming from the front of our vehicle. Our vehicle drive, uh, slows down, pulls over to the side of the road. And all of a sudden, all three of them get out, and Jerry's to the left, Bill is to the right. I'm in the middle. I was always in the middle freaking guy. I hated it. And what if my kids got in the car and they start complaining about being in the middle of the person? I'd say, you'd be a bad hostage. And, <laughs> and, and, I had to go Bill. And so we're, we're sitting there and we're handcuffed, blindfolded, which and you can see the smoke coming in. And Jerry, Jewish, uh, and he's the older, he's like 50, and Billy and I are in their 20s, and he goes, guys, I can see it now. What a freaking great movie this is going to be. <laughs> he had a Jew, a Polak, and a Hispanic guy all tied up in the freaking back of a car, and the car breaks down in the middle of the desert. I got the start of our movie right here. <laughs> and we start laughing, right? Because, I mean, that, that, sadly enough, that's the kind of shit that we had to laugh at because it was stupid, but it was kind of funny at the time. Little did we realize, all of a sudden, you hear a car on the highway slow down, and you hear him get into the gravel because our hood's up, and all of a sudden, Ali, one of the guards, he comes, he pulls the curtain, he takes his weapon, and he says, don't to speak. And so everything was, don't to speak, don't to, don't to lose all this other stuff. And so all of a sudden, here's this good Samaritan, back up in the gravel, vehicle stops, turns off the vehicle, opens the door, Close the door and hear him walking on the gravel because everything's hearing. Uh, that's why I, I have to have hearing aids. I think I over exercised my hearing back then uh, in glasses. But um, you hear this individual, so I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go with you. And all of a sudden you hear them talking, and all of a sudden you hear a little ruckus, and you hear <clears throat> Ali, Ali. Ali gets out five hours, six hours, I have no idea how long it took takes, but the hood goes down, you see another vehicle in front of us, the hood's up, and whatever they needed to fix our vehicle had come from that guy's vehicle. But that guy, another dead body that was lost. No, had no idea, our vehicle drove off. We get to the American Embassy, We uh, they put us again into the building, uh, into one of the offices, and the M-line pulled us, and you can see now at the American Embassy in this office, they put us, there's bullet holes all over the, the ceiling. It's like, shit, there's been a firefight here. And we're the only ones left. Now we're thinking, it's October of 1980, we're thinking we're the only Americans and that there had been a rescue operation. And so that night, the Iranians, uh, they come in, and Billy and I, I can tell you, it doesn't look like it now, but I, I was doing 600 sit-ups, 300 push-ups a day. Um, walking back and forth 650 times, just to exercise. Here I was running seven miles each day, and now you're tied for the first 30 days. Now you're locked in a room, you have to exercise to keep your, your body going. So they, uh, they would walk in occasionally as Billy and I would exercise. And so this night, they come in and said, we want to arm wrestle you. You know what I'm saying? Bring it on. So they walk out and got a chair, and, uh, two chairs and a table, and Jerry's going, oh, you guys watch it, they're, they're setting us up for something, something something's happening. Oh, Jerry, no, 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 we got these little freaking little kids, what the hell? And so all of a sudden, they come in, and we arm wrestle, and we smoke them, as we knew we would. And all of a sudden, they're walking out, and Billy and I are high-fiving, and Jerry's going, oh, you guys, you gotta be careful. All of a sudden, they turn around, and they said, we want to wrestle you. And we're thinking, well, they be shitting me? 
I said, you know, WWE wrestling, I mean, Marine Corps wrestling, but yeah. We said, yeah, yeah, bring it on, come on, bring it on. So we move our table, our two chairs, we bring our little three-inch foam mattresses, and all of a sudden, Billy goes, now, Mike, you go in, you wear them out, and then I'll come in, and I'll do the final hole. I said, that's a, that sounded pretty good. Yeah, I mean, just a little skinny guys, like, no problem. So as we're sitting there, Billy's looking over my shoulder, and Jerry's done looking over this shoulder, and I got my back turned towards the door. I'm on the three mats, and all of a sudden the door opens, and they go, holy cow. It was their Olympic 1980 wrestling champ. <laughs> yeah, because 1980, they boycotted the Olympics. And so they bring the Iranian Olympic wrestler into the room. I said, Billy, this freaking guy is going to eat my lunch. He goes, no, no, Rocky, you, you can do it. I said, no, there's no way. And so I start to take my shirt off. I get my back turned, and I get my sh start to take my shirt. And Billy's screaming, Rocky, watch out. He charges me. So at that time, we're in a very small room. So I take the guy with his momentum. And folks, I can tell you, for 444 days, every time, um, I forgot to tell you that if I needed to go to the restroom, you had to knock on the door, put a piece of paper underneath the door. You go to the restroom. You didn't leave that room. And every time they would come, and if you knock the door too loud, they tell you have to wait. So if you knock the door real nice and politely, they would come. I wanted so much to grab their throat and just rip their, their, their cords out. I mean, that's the hatred you had. And that night when that guy freaking charged me, and he was huge. He was freaking big. Same height, but he was just, his arms were the size of my freaking thighs. And, but I just had the strength, and I picked him up, and I threw him up against the, the wall onto his shoulder, and the same shoulder I take, and I threw him back down onto the concrete, onto that shoulder, and he lies in agony, and he's moaning. And I get up and look at Billy, and a high five, and Jerry goes, oh shit, they're gonna freaking, they're gonna kill us. <laughs> so sure enough, this so-called around the wrestler, uh, they have to drag out of that room. Well, little did I realize that I was recently, last year, at the Silent Warrior event, and these guys heard that I had participated in the 1980 uh, Tehran Embassy Dean Wrestling Championship. So they gave me two medals for winning the 1980 Olympics as hostage. So um, at the same time, little did we realize that, that these guys that were out at the special operations, uh, these were guys that were on the desert uh, to come in to rescue us. Uh, they presented Billy and I uh, our uh, hand um, headband that had litmus paper, uh, so that the night that we were to be taken, uh, we were came outside and they used night vision goggles. It was the first time that they really used night vision goggles for a rescue operation. And so, had we came out with this headband and a litmus paper, we would have popped, showing that that was one of the hostages. So. They presented that to Billy and I after, what, 42 years um, that we, uh, you know, came home. So it was an incredible time, but here, uh, Bill, Jerry was right. Uh, two days later, after we humiliated them, um, and the, the guy that basically came in to wrestle with me, he came back a day later, his arm was in the sling, and he presented his hand as a handshake. He didn't look at me in the face, but he presented his uh, hand as a handshake. And so a day later, um, sure enough, they put us in a big prison where we spent October, November, December. Uh, and this was not a pretty prison. Um, I became a plumber in prison. Um, and uh, in, in this prison, it was just a hole. I mean, that's where you went to the restroom. Mr. Odie was 68 years of age at this time. And in this prison, we start hearing other Americans, which kind of made us feel better that we weren't the only ones there. And so you heard Mr. Odie, Mr. Odie, and excuse my language, he, uh, I can't say the word, Mr. Odie would use that F word, I mean, like morning, noon, and night, I mean, like a drunken ring of R&R. &R. And uh, he just told me, he said, if you don't give me a, you know what, shitter, I'm going to be shitting all over the place. And so you're laughing, like hearing Mr. Odie, and all of a sudden, and, and I mean, because you had to try to squat, and the poor guy couldn't squat. And so finally, two days later, they, you hear them bring something into the corridor 
of our uh, prison cell. They could hear him screaming at them. And at this point in time, they brought in Dick Moorfield and Alan Kolozinski. So I have five people. We have five people in our uh, our room, uh, our prison cell, uh, that look something like this, but a little bit larger. And he, you said you guys play uh, bridge here, right? Well, Dick Moorfield knew how to play bridge, and what a freaking great game to play when you got a shitload of time. I mean, you play bridge, but how many people play bridge? Only four. So we had five. So it was my day to sit down and not be doing anything. And all of a sudden, you could hear the guard go to each one of the cell blocks, and you can hear him mumble something. And all of a sudden, he came to ours, and I'm sitting there just laying over the, the cot, you know, daydreaming because it's the worst thing you want to do when you're held hostage. And all of a sudden, the door opens, and they said, Anybody know plumbing? I said, Oh, yeah, I do. I did nothing about plumbing. I said, I, I knew what something to do. So they blindfold me, and because again, every time you left that room, you go to the restroom, they blindfold me. For 444 days, even though they knew what the bathroom was. And so they took me down and they unblindfolded me and they said, Can you fix? And here laid a, uh, a porcelain chair, uh, a tape with all the items in it, and they said, Can you fix? And I said, uh, Yeah, I can fix. I became a diver, I became a plumber. And I said, We need bolts, we don't have I said, No, you need bolts, I need uh, rings, and you know, we had no rings. I said, Give me a plastic bag, and you know, holes. There were holes all the way around to fill the tank. And so three days later, all the things that they wrote down, we brought them and I installed the shitter in the prison, uh, which is probably still there to this day. And so Mr. Oney did thank me uh, when we were finally uh, taken uh, for installing the shitter in the prison. But little did we realize we were in prison and uh, we find out, uh, I think it was the latter part of October, uh, through a St. Louis sporting magazine. Do you remember this? Yeah. yeah. That due to the death of the Shah of Iran, the tennis tournament was postponed. Are you guys reading this? What? And sure enough, they had put in one of the sporting news magazines that the Shah, because they knew that the Iranians weren't letting us read anything but sports material. So sure enough, it snuck through and we found out what we were We were taken because of the Shah. Well, the Shah is dead. He died in freaking in July, a day after my birthday. <laughs> and that was October, and, and we went to the door, pounding on the door, and we said, hey, the, the Shaw, yeah, the Shaw is dead. He goes, no, we do not believe the Shaw is dead. What are you talking about? It says it right here. And they grabbed the paper like they knew they screwed up, and they got it through. And, uh, no, we don't believe the Shaw is dead. Well, what do you mean you don't believe? Well, we couldn't see the body, so we, we don't believe it. So I can tell you, the shit was going down now, uh, because you were hoping, you were praying that maybe uh, the Shaw would come back, and now all of a sudden, the Shaw is dead, July, and it's October, what the hell do they want now? And uh, we knew that our country was not going to negotiate, because they tell you, they never negotiate with terrorists. So I spent my second Thanksgiving, my second Christmas, and I can tell you folks, every time they would leave you uh, down to go to the restroom blindfolded, you'd come back and they'd, they'd close the door, you would grab the door and you would throw your blindfold off and walk into the hallway where they had all the weapons. They didn't want to see, they didn't want you to see the people that were out there with the weapons. And as you walked out, they would all come with their loaded weapon. And I hate to say it, but you know, you get to a point that you don't really freaking care anymore. You start taking the weapon and you put the weapon in your mouth. Just pull the trigger. Pull the freaking trigger. Just end this stuff. I mean, because it's now over 400 and some days. And you just didn't see any light at the end of the tunnel. tunnel. And so little did we uh, realize the second Christmas. Um, it's January 20th, 1981. And uh, that night, they come into our room, and uh, they blindfold us. They don't handcuff us, don't tie us. They lead us from the room, and instead of turning right, they turn. I turn left. That was the first one. Jerry had his arm on uh, my shoulder. Billy had his arm on Jerry's shoulder. And we're leading out blindfolded, and we're thinking we're going to go home and they're blindfolded. So what the hell is this? And uh, trust me, my vocabulary is much better now than it was back then. It had to be politically correct. Mm -hmm. So we get down the corridor about 10 yards, and he stops me, and he turns me, and he opens up the door. And I can tell you, folks, that they had taken our shoes not from us. Uh, I wore plastic open toe uh, sandal shoes that were size six, and I wore size nine. Um, um, since March of 1980. 
And I remember walking out that night, it was cold. Uh, there was snow, it snows in Iran, in Tehran. And that night I remember walking out into the snow and crunching the snow. And the wet snow going through my toes. And the snow was hitting me in my blindfold. And it, it felt so good because I hadn't felt snow in two years. And I remember crunching, going to a place, they put me onto a vehicle, turn me around, put me down, the vehicle drives off, it scrapes the right side of the tree, jumps a curb, turns right, drives for I don't know how long, and all of a sudden it makes a right hand turn, and you hear a sound of an airplane. This is a sound that you would pray for, you would cry for, you would hope for an opportunity. And about this time, uh, the, this, it wasn't this plane here, but um, the vehicle that we were in parks right behind the airplane. And the force of the jet was pushing against the vehicle that we were on, and you could hear them, and this is before I had hearing aids and sit on glasses. Um, they tell you they're blindfold. And you would never allow them blindfold. If you did try, and they catch you, they'd you know, pound on you a little bit. And so you start them blindfold, and they tell you, and here you are looking at people that you hadn't seen since November 4th of 1979. Uh, you look bad, you smell bad, and you're in shock. You don't know what the heck is going on. And all of a sudden, they start taking one by one. There was a, a, a plank, uh, a, a little walkway on the back of the airplane that's not shown here. And we're walking up the, the game plane, and I hadn't seen a woman in 444 days. Um, and I can tell you, as, uh, as mentioned earlier, um, that praying and thinking of my past, and there was this one young girl that I had met right before going over there. And I can tell you, the first 30 days, uh, that young girl, uh, I mean, gosh, she was 17. I was 22, and she was my icon. How many of you have seen the movie uh, Tom Hanks, Castle? Yeah, he had a locket, right? I didn't have a locket, but I had her picture in my head. And I can tell you, that picture of her kept me alive for those first days. I just said, you know, I'm not gonna let these people get the best of me. Because what they were trying to do was break you, break you down to the weakest element. And I just told them, I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna make it out of here, and I'm gonna make it home. And so, here I feel moved for the first time. She takes me, walks me down the, uh, the aisle, the airplane, puts me down. And now mind you, you're seeing other people that are other hostages. You're, you're free, but you're not free, if that makes sense. I mean, you're not high-fiving because you're on an airplane and they're chanting death for America. Airplanes and chanting death for America just don't freaking go well. So um, little did we realize, does anybody know why the hostages were released? The United States gave Iran $8.3 billion on January 17th, but this is January 20th. Two C-130s arrived with gold on January 17th, $8.3 billion, and this uh, Algerian airline landed with it. But Iran said, we'll release the hostages, we won. And I can tell you, for 444 days, the Islamic Republic of Iran said, it is not you, the American people, we hate. It's your government. But we will use you to humiliate your government. And that's what they were doing. The last freaking thing. And so we get on this airplane, the door starts to close, and you start to turn around. Well, wait, where's, uh, where's Hank? Where's Mary? Where's Gene? Where's Judy? Where's Kurt? Where's Debbie? Where's everybody else? And he said, Yo, you're the last. The others were let go a year earlier. We had no idea that other people were let go and that we were the last of the 52 of the 65. I mean, you, you had no news. I mean, you had no idea what the heck was going on. And so again, uh, the pilot comes on and says, broken English, we must leave very quickly. Uh, we've been here waiting for you. He goes down to the end of the runway. He stops, turns left, goes a little bit further, stops, turn, turns left, goes up a little bit further. He's got a foot on the brake and he starts to accelerate and plane's shaking all of a sudden comes back down to an angle. The folks, I can tell you, all the, all the mock firing squads, the Russian roulette, the psychological mind games uh, that we're just uh, be here all day talking about them. And here we think they're, they're playing one last mind game. Uh, the pilot comes on and says, they turn the runway lights off. We can't take off. Well, they did that and waited 20 minutes, 20 minutes, that Carter left office and President Reagan came in just to stab President Carter in the back. And what did they do to President Reagan three years, two years later? Uh, Beirut, they killed 240 Marines. That was an Iranian suicide bomber. Again, Muslim is not born with hatred, they're freaking taught hatred. 
And again, November 4th, 1979, I had a chance to pull that freaking trigger. And I made regret. But again, as General Mattis, Mad Dog Mattis said, Rocky, you did what a Marine was told to do. And that was a stand down. But I can tell you the war in Karachi, ladies and gentlemen, it started November 4th, 1979, and it freaking it still continues to this day. They have humiliated every, every, every president that we had. And they continue to do. They're great negotiators. And he told us, it is every four to eight years your government comes and goes. And we know that. Their government has stayed the same since 1979. It's radical moments. And so they know that. They know how to play. That airplane, the lights finally came on. The pilot kind of says it's time to leave. And I can tell you, my fingers uh, were in, embedded into the armrest as that plane starts to come off. We get into Turkish airspace, and uh, two uh, fighters were escorting us. Uh, the pilot comes on and said that uh, two fighters are escorting us to Athens, Athens Greece. And uh, like I said, my pair of pants I had. My left cheek was completely hanging out of it, but we came on the We knew at that point in time uh, that we were free and uh, we were going home. And so here's a, a picture of obviously, a uh, picture we get to Athens. Athens, they removed the pilot. The airline stewardess just got new ones. We flew from Athens to Algiers. Algiers, we board uh, Scott Air Force Base, medevac planes. And, and I'm getting on this medevac plane. And Mr. Sickman, it's great to see you. I said, how do you know who I was? Oh, Mr. Sickman, we've been watching you for four, four, four days. I mean, it's, I had no idea um, the notoriety of the, the Iran hostage crisis. But, and it was one of those things, like I told you at the beginning, it was like the Vietnam veterans. Everybody, they forgot about them. But one good thing um, that did happen after we came home, uh, the Vietnam War was finally built in 1983. Because you realized what they had done to the Vietnam veterans was wrong. And how true was they did um and but the good thing the wall was built the bad thing is all those individuals from the time of the vietnam wall to you know 1983 that never did get their thank you and welcome home we obviously got over abundance and this is the hospital this is us leaving in our greens um that next day and obviously at this point in time president carter and uh, he came over um, he wanted to meet with the hostages, and obviously we had told the State Department, and uh, President Carter came into the office and he said, you know, uh, I'm the one, um, but when you make a decision, uh, like what I did and what I was showing, I was in, informed that you guys were well taken care of, but obviously people you know, always say that. And so the President uh, makes the decision, and he will have to live with those eight individuals that lost their life. And, um, and of course, us being held for 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 days. And I can tell you, uh, there were many that uh, tried to commit suicide in uh, sight uh, while being held hostage. And thank goodness, I was uh, I was young, I was naive, um, I wasn't married. But all the State Department guys that were married, uh, they they just ate on. Them. Um, and there was one smart thing Marine Corps did was make sure that we weren't married. I didn't have the responsibility. I didn't have the idea of what my poor parents were going through. Um, but met the President uh, Reagan right there and had an Oval Office uh, event. And of course, uh, I came home, made my first phone call, uh, the Virgin told me. And uh, so it was one of those things my dad goes, Rocky Jill's here. I said, she waited. And he goes, well, she wants to talk to you. I'm thinking, shit, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> uh, and uh, so she gets on the phone, we chit chat. She goes, Rocky, you gotta make a decision. I said, what do you mean? She goes, either me or the military, but I can't do this. And so, and, and General Mattis said this now also. He said, you know, Rocky, thank goodness she got a taste of the military before she got into the military. So many people, you know, get into the military and think it's going to be really great, and all of a sudden something happens, uh, and it's, they realize. So, but um, she knew uh, I was in for, at that point in time, six years, uh, but I loved the military, but I chose wisely. I uh, got out, we got married in 1981, and obviously, uh, like I said, those eight individuals, folks, those eight individuals, this is something I, I think of every, every freaking one. Those eight individuals not only lost their life, they lost their family. And you can, you can see my family, wonderful wife, three wonderful kids, there's Anna right here, Chelsea, and Spencer, um, and 
uh, four grandkids. Those guys would never, ever go fishing with their sons, walk their daughters down the aisle. Um, <laughs> this is always the hardest part. That, uh, you know, what Fools of Art is all about is providing scholarships to families of fallen disabled. And, you know, when people uh, ask you, relate, I say, yeah, I can relate. I mean, I live with it for the rest of my life. But these individuals, those eight, uh, sacrificed their life for my life. And it's how do you, how do you pay that back? Um, other than help support and make sure that the American people know that 1% of our population um, serves our country in providing this, the free society. Um, and the number of times, I think I'm not counting the two, I was uh, in Iran, uh, but I was probably uh, five total years uh, I was out of country. And so the men and women that go through, all of you that serve, you know what it's like. And so here's the picture of Jerry. Uh, Jerry Gavlin, now what's our time, Hank? Okay. Okay. Um, I, the story about Jerry Botkin, folks. Um, Jerry, as you can see, is a little bit older. Um, when we were held hostage, just as all of you were held hostage, the media would find out um, where did Hank and Mary live? Where did, where did Rocky grow up? They went to my hometown and they interviewed everybody. I was a captain, my, my senior football year, interviewed my captain or my coach and everything else. And they said, Jerry Plotkin is uh, caught at the American Embassy with a quarter of a million dollars in cash. What the hell is he doing? And little did they realize that Jerry Plotkin had served a year in prison for narcotics charges. And so two individuals, a, uh, a writer, and a high-ranking um, police official said, you know what, he's in prison. He's in the American Embassy dealing with drugs and he got caught. But we can't release the story because the Iranians would kill him, he's Jewish, and he's a drug dealer. So they waited until January 20th, 1981, when we were released, and they released the story that Jerry Plotkin was being investigated by the State Department for drug trafficking. No truth whatsoever. He sues for sixty freaking million dollars. The case lasts seven years. The first three years, now interesting, the first three years, the judge, are you a private citizen? Or are you a public figure? Because if you're a public figure, people can say anything they want about you. So what was it? He was a private citizen thrown into a public figure situation. So the judge granted him to three years for him to be granted the right to sue from now so on. For the next four years, Jerry has a heart transplant. The only thing he wanted to do was get home, have some boys go fishing, go camping. He had to come home and have to regain his freaking, his right of who he was, a hostage. Billy and I had a ticker tape raised. Jerry's fighting for his respect. Um, he finally had two boys. One boy went to school. And a boy uh, asked his teacher, can I have my daddy come speak to the class? No, well, your, your daddy's a drug dealer. We can't. I mean, those are <laughs> so Billy and I worked with Jerry for the next three years. The case finally was settled out of court a week before it was to go to court. What it was, I had no idea because when it's settled out of court, you, you can't find out. Um, they have, had to make a statement. On the last page of the newspaper, they had to make the statement. Not on the headline, as 1981, when he came home, it was headline news. But uh, he died then, uh, what, 10 years later. I mean, so he wasted seven years of just trying to regain his respect. So the other Marines at West Point and um, some of the hostages out of the 52, there are 33 of the hostages remaining. My son uh, was in the movie Argo, for those of you who saw it. My wife and I are at a wedding in Columbus, Ohio. Synchronicity, they have it, is a uh, time and place and things happening. And, my wife were there at this wedding. The father of Michael was like, "Won't you meet my sister? She's a casting director out in LA. Never know if somebody might need somebody to help their son." So I met her, gave her my card, and said, "Yeah, if anything ever pops up, please let me know." Three days later, she's in LA, back in LA, emailing her girlfriend, which is another uh, director, and she says, "Hey, what are you working on?" Girl goes, "I'm working with Ben Affleck, George Clooney, and the cast of others. John Goodman from St. Louis." As you can see right here, about a movie about the Iran hostage crisis. And she goes, no shit, I was with one of the hostages this past week at a wedding. She goes, really, who was that? She goes, Rocky Sickle. She goes, right, Rocky Sickle, he was one of the rings, right? She goes, yeah, he was. She goes, 
his character, Sergeant Sigmund so at the end of the movie, when you watch it the next time, watch for the character played by Sergeant Sigmund, a much better looking guy than I am. He did it right. Um, it's uh, my name, my character is in the movie. So uh, two days later, they contact Ben. Ben said, yeah, I'd love to meet Rocky, bring him out. Because the movie is about six house guests that were in the visa bill, but they never really got the story about um, a hostage. So. I flew out overnight, flew my son out, and my son always, ever since he was six years old, wanted to be an actor, much like a better looking guy as I. Um, and so his first movie was an Academy Award winning movie, Argo. Um, and so he uh, is still acting to this day. And I retired from Budweiser uh, 2016 after 34 wonderful years. I met Major Rooney, now Lieutenant Colonel Rooney, uh, in 2007, and that's where um, obviously, Mrs. Silby, uh, Mr. Silby used to work with him at Budweiser, but uh, this is when I first met Folds of Honor, and uh, it was one of those synchronicities that, uh, you know, time and place that I was a director of military sales. And here, Major Rooney came in and had this program. And I'm happy to tell you that since uh, 2011, when Budweiser first started, Budweiser and Navy wholesalers around the country have raised over $19 million for Folds of Honor. And that's what I continue to do. I can tell you it's a therapeutic piece. Just as my good wife, if it wasn't for my good wife, Joe, I would be in a ditch somewhere. But I can tell you Folds of Honor is a very therapeutic piece for me. Every morning, I don't wake up feeling bad. I think that whenever something's tough, I think about those eight guys that had to fly through the night, the night of April 24th into the morning of April 25th, and then to see their buddies die uh, in a burning wreckage. And those guys, when they, saw me, they said, Rocky, it was, it was so hard watching our buddies burn, but we couldn't get you. So, but the interesting thing, like I said, folks, uh, Special Operations was created because of that rescue uh, operation. So, coming to a close, I'm going to a, a convenience store one day, uh, one morning, I had to catch a 6.30 flight, those of you that have done that, you know, it's a pain in the butt, but I'm going through the house running crazy, and I get to a convenience store, I get a, a water, a banana, a breakfast bar, and I go up and I owe $4.44. Oh. It's whenever, whenever I think that time is, you know, really not good, and uh, things are, are overloaded, that number 444, the man upstairs reminds me, Rocky, would you rather be here catching a 630 flight or over in that shithole with three rifles in the back of my head when they stripped this new um, that I had to live with? And so it's it's one of those things. I mean, it's the strangest um, thing that um, whenever I'm driving down the road, I feel bad looking at a license plate, and there's 444 right on the license plate. The man always reminds me, and it is, it, it's my reminder, my reminder. Uh, my kids see it all the time, and uh, they remember. So with that, hey, Mary, um, so wonderful to see you, you guys again. And uh, again, number one, thank you to all the military and those that were there waiting on those individuals, because you know uh, the strain. And for those of you that have never been in the military, imagine your child being held hostage for four or five days. Hopefully that never happens to you, but that it was so hard my parents got love them. I had a picture of them before and after, but you know, they, they finally passed uh, was 12 years ago after uh, 64 some years of marriage. Uh, my dad died in June and my mom, uh, April. My dad died in April, the mom died in June, same year. Uh, talk about the broken heart syndrome. So with that, anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us never forget that freedom is not free. So, questions? I just want to ask one question. Yes. Uh, you never mentioned how you were fed or Papa, but you give water or food or just saving yourself about no, um, no, how you're fed. Uh, all of you have gone through difficult times, right? Do you feel like eating when that tragic occurs? I can tell you for the first 30 days, I mean, we had uh, a piece of bread. You just, you didn't feel like eating. Your, your mind was just uh, going crazy. Your body was going crazy. Um, you're tied to a chair. Um, but it wasn't until that 30 days later did I realize that I wanted to get home to that young lady that I started eating. Um, so they gave you uh, rice, 
uh, noon, uh, goat cheese, hot tea. Uh, so you start to eat. Um, you had to, to keep yourself fit. And then when you were locked in a room, you had three plates, uh, Billy, Jerry's, and mine, and I'll eat a cook. We gave names to all of our, uh, our captors. I'll eat a cook. He was the guy that rolled the cart down with the food, and you could hear him uh, rolling down. Oh, here comes Ali. He would stop in front of your plate, or in front of your door, unlock the door, open the door, grab the plates, close the door, lock the door, put the food on the plate, unlock the door, open the door, put the food down, close the door, lock the door, and move to the next. And so, but yeah, it was, if you didn't eat, um, we did have some strange games. Whoever pulled out the strangest hair from the other, uh, from your plate, you got the uh, dates of the other individual's food. So it, you played crazy games, uh, but I mean, it was it was edible. Um, I can tell you that when we were in prison, Ali, we asked Ali to help, you know, cook. So he brings us, and this is during the war with Iran and Iraq. Those of you that remember, happened in the 80s, and we were right there during the dog fights. We had blackout, and so the only thing we had was a candle. And so he brought in all these boxes of raisins. They said, yes, put raisins in bowl. So we took the boxes of raisins that were, um, I don't know where they got them, but we started realizing that, shit, there's, no, excuse me, raisins. there's more than raisins in this can, or in this box. They're like dead ants. <laughs> and we didn't realize it until the end. And all of a sudden, Ali comes in and goes, do oh, you, you like, you like help? Mm. We said, yeah, Holly, but there's ants in here. Okay, thank you. And he pulls the cart. Well, we still had those rice, those, uh, those ants with that, uh, those raisins that night. I mean, uh, we had powdered milk. Uh, I hated powdered milk uh, growing up. And I can remember the powdered milk had dead gnats on the top. So what we would take is our T-shirt, and we would just filter, you know, through the T-shirt, uh, the milk. And so, but again, it was all edible, um, it, and uh, it was, you just dreamt about all the food back home that uh, your, your parents made, but yeah. And hygiene, I can tell you, like I said, I didn't take a shower. Every morning, I take a shower. You know why? I freaking can. Every morning, I take a shower. And I even maybe take two showers a freaking day. Why? Because I can. Because for 444 days, you never had to run. I go outside and just enjoy standing outside. Why? Because I can. I mean, for 444 days, I never had that. Mm -hmm. And so it's amazing uh, what freedom is all about when you take it for granted. So hopefully that answers. <laughs> Any other questions? I'm so sorry for keeping you long. You have to wipe the ink. He's my time to <laughs> So, all right. Well, everybody, again, thank you so much. And I told Hank, my wife and I, we're going to be getting up in age, so we have to look for a place. And so Hank is uh, selling me in here this morning. So uh, hopefully uh, I might see you here someday. So, all right, guys. Thank you so much.